Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Desk Storks, your favorite board game and design and creation podcast. I'm Kyle, I'm the dork, and welcome. This is Low Level Monsters Part 11, baby. Let's go. And today we're talking about the peasantry, the plebeians, the common folk. That's right. I just got inspired to do some rabble rousing, rioting peasants. Uh, before we get into this, like, share, comment, subscribe, do all the light, the YouTube MacGuffin stuff. Uh, if you would like to support us over at Desks and Dorks, please, 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 the links to our games are in the description below. That's the best way to support us. And if you haven't had a chance to check it out, yesterday we did a whole thing on free resources that can help you make your own RPGs which are super cool, and then tomorrow we've got low-level spells, and on Friday, I'm proud to announce that I actually have a pretty exclusive interview. Um, I'm, I'm very, very excited about it, so more on that on Friday, but again, let's talk about some peasants, baby. Uh, I love peasants. I love common folk. I, it is a interesting thing, both historically and within the fantasy realm and fantasy genre, uh, but peasants have been, and for the longest time continue to be, or the common folk uh, so to speak, have continued to be a source of really interesting historical and fantastical adventures. Um, historically speaking, peasant riots and peasant wars have actually been a massive driver for both social and economic change within our own world. And in D&D setting, there really isn't anything quite like battling against a bunch of peasants. And so I figured out I'd figured I'd spruce them up a little bit. Uh, so first things first, let's talk about the rabble rousers. That's right. The rabble rouser, the peasant that just wants to lead all of the other ones against the horrors and the injustices of the world. You can treat this peasant as a first level bard with bardic inspiration. Uh, this means that they probably have about eight to 10 hit points and may or may not be the best fighters out of the village. But here's where the interesting thing happens. Their bardic inspiration is always going to be in effect. Um, the, uh, the rabble rouser, as long as they're speaking and rabble rouser, they don't need an instrument to do this. The bardic inspiration is always going to be in effect. However, there's an additional bonus. Any time that one of the rabble-rousing peasants actually does damage to a member of your party, they'll get an additional plus one damage on the next hit. This effect is cumulative, and it goes up to plus seven. What I wanted to do was I wanted to make the, the riotous, the bloodthirsty mob an actual mechanic. So just as they are bloodthirsty in name, they will be bloodthirsty in nature. And once they start doing damage, that damage is just going to continue to ratchet up and increase. This means that combat is like a puzzle, and your party is going to start thinking about how can we take out this rabble rouser, either from a distance, can we poison him, can we put him to sleep, how do we deal with this peasant um, so that we're not getting continually just absolutely starched by like Willem the blacksmith or like Horatio the farmhand who suddenly went from, you know, threshing wheat to threshing your face for like 19 points of damage so could be potentially useful uh the war wagon this is actually taken from the bohemian wars this was a real thing um guns were not super great at the time and so thick wood could actually help stop early firearms and essentially what you had was these wagons with gunmen inside them and they would literally drag them into the middle of the battle they would flip up this big wooden shell and dudes would just literally just sit there and shoot from their wagon um it's kind of like one of the early forms of tank which I think is pretty interesting for us though it's a little bit interesting so they can move 35 feet per round they're relatively quick um, and there is a 50% chance that you will miss them with projectile weapons or single target spells um, I don't know why it got caught off but they're supposed to have an 18 armor class and they're going to make three plus six 1d8 crossbow attacks at a 45 foot range every single time where this becomes interesting is that if you use an AoE spell, it does max damage automatically. Um, now, that might sound overpowered to you, but remember, these are low-level monsters. So at this point in the game, your party is probably not going to be lobbing fireballs around, but it might get them to think about lower-level AoE spells that they might normally not choose to use. So, for example, a wizard who has to make the tactical decision of running up and actually using burning hands on this war wagon, that's a high-risk, high-reward strat when you're up against something like this war wagon. And so I like this because it makes them very difficult to take down unless you have a specific type of uh, spell. And the other thing is too, let's say that you don't have access to AOE spells at the level that you're taking on the war wagon. There's nothing stopping the party from trying to get access to a magic item that will allow them to do that. Or if you are a clever DM, you can of course put in your own NPC that might potentially give them a magic item like a scroll of fireball or the like. 
um, in exchange for some sort of service. Or you could always do the classic D&D thing of, I, I'll do this for you, but you're magically bound to give me a favor, repay this favor uh, later on down the road. I think this is a pretty neat decision, and I really like the War Wagon. Uh, but not as much as I like the Snake Oil Salesman. That's right. I'm, I'm tying in my love of the Wild West mythos with this particular character. The Snake Oil Salesman is a charlatan, a fast talker, and a merchant of sorts, and they sort of hawk all of these different potions. Uh, why I like them is they can be beaten with a DC 18 charisma check, uh, whether this is diplomacy or intimidate, whatever. Um, you can negotiate with them to either leave the village alone or just leave you alone. Uh, but why I like them is they just throw potions. That's the only thing that they do. These have no damage. Um, and I literally just would like you to go to the Dungeon Master's Guide, use the level one or like the low level potion table where it says like randomize magic items and literally literally just go buck wild. So sometimes the potions they throw are going to heal. Sometimes the potions are literally going to just incinerate a party member on contact. Uh, sometimes, and if this is especially true if you want to do this, on a 1 or a 20, what I like to do is just have the vial that they throw just be like a random glass of water or like other random filth in a glass jar. I think that's kind of fun. They will use random guards to protect themselves. Uh, and yes, I did spell that wrong intentionally. Um, because he attack, he protect, but most importantly, he he oil of snack. Uh, and with that, thank you all so much for joining us for Desks and Dorks Low Level Monsters Part 11. If you like this, like, share, comment, subscribe. Again, if you love what we do here, the best way to support us is to go to the description below and either get yourself a digital copy or a physical copy of any of our RPGs. That actually is the best way to do it, uh, and we really sincerely appreciate it if you do. And hopefully this has been helpful to y'all. I'm Kyle Ott for Desks and Dorks, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.